right. Again, I want to welcome everybody out to our Wednesday evening study. It's always a joy to gather together. and I, I like Wednesday nights, and it's kind of I feel like Bible study time. I mean, we kind of read the, we're going through the book, uh, the Bible together, just, you know, kind of a warm, cozy time, I guess, kind of a more intimate, as, a, as Tim was pointing out, it's a little smaller group and a little more eye contact with individuals, and uh, yeah, I feel like it's kind of like at home with, not to call you my kids, but that's kind of the way it is. It's kind of like devotional time, you know, we go through the Bible, different books of the Bible together, and you know, go through a chapter or something like that, and just, you know, like, Sit in the living room, read through the Bible, and just enjoy what God has to speak to us. And so we're looking forward to wrapping up the book of Ezra tonight. Wow. We're already done with it. And uh, so I'm praying about it. I'm really leaning towards the book of Romans next week. Uh, I know it's kind of a jump from the Old Testament. We've been in the Old Testament the last couple books. We did Nehemiah and then uh, Ezra. But uh, I think... I believe Romans is one of those foundational books, so foundational to our faith, and it addresses, you know, that, that again, that establishes us in grace, and, and our, our relationship with the Lord is through grace, but also addresses some of those issues of how uh, overcoming sin, and here, of course, the book of Ezra is kind of, a, it, we're tonight, especially tonight, we're going to address Ezra is going to be praying for, and there's going to be a great revival going on amongst the people of Israel, and a great repentance. And I think Romans takes kind of a New Testament approach to how the Lord delivers us from sin and works that new life in Christ in us. And so, um, anyways, really looking forward to the book of Romans. So, again, you need to pray with me about that, and, and more than likely, that's where we're going to be going. One more announcement for tonight. First, I want to welcome again those visiting via Facebook. I keep forgetting to do that. So welcome those of us on social media. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. We're glad you're here with us. Um, but also, another announcement, and, and this is for you too. My wife says, make this announcement at the beginning. Maybe they'll come and be here for after service. We're going to, after service, we're going to uh, be rearranging the sanctuary a little bit for the women's event this, Friday, uh, this Saturday. So I guess there's chairs to be stacked and moved out of here and a few other things to be rearranged. So my, my goal is to wrap up a little early so that way we have time to do that and we can utilize um, more hands. Uh, there was a story about this pastor's conference and uh, you know they're, they're going through the regular sessions and all of a sudden the lights went out in the sanctuary. And so... Pastors all got together. They went over and found the electrical, you know, the electrical box, the circuit breaker box, and and they they all said, "Let's pray." So they all put their hands out and touched the electrical box, and they prayed over it. And all of a sudden, the lights went back on. And they go, "All right, many hands make light work." <laughs> so we got a lot of hands here, more than my two, and with many hands, we can make light work. Pardon the pun. Anyways, uh, yeah, maybe kind of a little pastor humor there for you. <laughs> all right. So, all right, Ezra chapter 10. Tonight's message titled, Crucified in Christ. And, uh, you know, honestly, this passage is, is tough in a sense that, it, it, you know, when you consider how the Lord does not, does not like divorce. You know, I want to preface this section. The Lord does not like a divorce. I mean, the Bible is very specific about that. You know, Jesus himself says, let no, you know, when God has made one, do not let no one make a, uh, break asunder. But here in this section, it addresses this issue that had occurred amongst the nation where they had intermarried with pagan wives. You know, they were a Jewish people. They're people, they're, you know, and of course, they're, and they're Jewish, not just a cultural thing, but in their culture was also wrapped their faith in God. I mean, built into their culture was their observance of knowing who their God is, their maker is. And so it's part of the nationality. It's part of who they are. Their, even their, their, their political laws, their, their governing laws were based in the scriptures. Um, you know, a scribe 
will be also considered a lawyer because they were the people that knew the law. Uh, a lot of times in the New Testament, we talk about when, when it refers to the scribes, most of them were also referred to as lawyers. They knew the law. They knew how to practice the law because studying the scriptures, you knew the law that, that they lived by, they're abided by. It was built into their society and who they are. So to intermarry with non-Jews would typically bring them away from their relationship with the Lord because when you're married to somebody, you become one with them, and they have certain practices that they're going to introduce into the marriage. And as God knows in his wisdom, because he's wise, he's all-knowing, I can't get any wiser than that, he's pretty wise, he says, hey, don't, don't marry in the pagan wives. In fact, he warned them when he says, when you go to this land I'm given to you, before even they went there, before they went to the promised land, he says, they were not to intermarry. They're not to make covenants with the people there. They were not to intermarry with them. They were not to give their kids in marriage to them. Because he says, if you do that, you're going to learn their customs. And then they're going to turn your heart from me towards their gods. And then, of course, that's going to create a, a separation. And, of course, that's exactly what happened. They began to intermarry, and eventually they were introduced to the pagan worship of those cultures. And because then they're worshiping the pagan gods, the deities of those cultures, those, those pagan cultures which, for which God was actually judging those people for worshiping because they were leading them down practices that were so corrupt and perverse and, and unhealthy. And so they were now engaged in those same things, which led to them being carried away captive. Now they're back in the land. God's given them grace. He's... He's restored them back. The temple has been rebuilt, symbolizing his relationship with them in a sense. He's a place where they connect with him. Not that God needed to be in the temple, but it was a place of, it was a signifying that their relationships being rebuilt. They're being strengthened in their relationship with the Lord. The temple was just rebuilt. Now Ezra comes to instruct the people, to lead them, to give them understanding about following their God. He arrives on the scene, and one of the first things you find out is that the people had begun to intermarry. It was brought to his attention that there was intermarrying going on, not, and not just amongst the general public, but amongst the leaders, the leadership, as well as the priests and the Levites were the most guilty of it. So the spiritual leaders were engaged in this as well. Also, Malachi gives some insight into this as well. Malachi addresses this, I think, in chapter 2, how that actually, a practice that was getting engaged, in fact, even some rabbis even surmised that this was happening, was that they started, they got rid of their wives they had grown up with, their first wife, in a sense, the wife they had come to this land with, because they wanted a younger, more attractive wife. And so they, got, they were getting rid of their first wife so they can find a, a more younger, healthy, you know, healthy wife, uh, not healthy, but a more attractive wife, and they were engaging in getting, marrying these, these pagan wives. And that was indicated as well. And, of course, that's addressed in Malachi. So Ezra, he went to prayer. When, he, when this was brought to him, he went and just tore his robe. He, he went in and, and just dropped to the ground and just, just praying desperately for the Lord. And so here, chapter, one, chapter 10, verse 1 says, Now while Ezra was praying... While he was confessing, weeping, and bowing down before the house of God. So an idea there indicated in the Hebrew that bowing down. It wasn't just one time he was, he wasn't just down, but it was like this, you know, this repetitive thing. Like he was just, it was like he's just this, this grief that was being expressed and inside of, because he understood, because he was familiar with God's law. He understood the pattern that had led the nation into captivity at the beginning. He understood where this would lead in, in the end. He understood where this was going to go. And so that's what made it so heavy. Though at the time it may not have seemed so bad. Oh, they're just intermarrying, not a big deal. But the problem is, is he, under, he understood where this would lead to. He saw where this was leading to. And he understood this would lead them right back to the captivity they once were in. And so he was broken over this. And as I pointed out last week, 
the difference between Nehemiah and Ezra. As Nehemiah, of course, came as a governing official, and we hear, read how he, when he came across this issue, he pulled out their hair and, 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 and yelled at them for doing this. Ezra, on the other hand, he pulls out his hair, rips his robe, and he goes before the Lord pr- praying. And uh, we see the effectiveness of this as well. As he's confessing and weeping and bowing his head before the Lord, the house of God, we read here that a very large assembly of men, women and children, gathered to him from Israel. For the people wept very bitterly. So we see this response occur. As he is praying and confessing, confessing the sin that was there, you see this revival occur. This is a clear example of revival as he's praying desperately for the Lord, broken before the Lord. You know, I think so often we neglect or we we don't experience the transformation that God wants to do in our lives because we aren't realizing how significant, how awful our sins are. We become comfortable in them. And I think that's kind of what had happened here. The people, they kind of got comfortable in this practice. It's the way that everyone else lived. But here comes this man who had prepared his heart to, follow, to do the will of God, to teach the word of God. And so he prepared his heart in God's word, and he prepared his heart to do God's word, and he prepared his heart to teach God's word. So he was... He was and in himself, somewhat, he was baptized in God's word. He was, he was full of God's word. And he'd embodied it. And so here as, as the word of God, as he sees the sin, the grievousness, it was shining bright upon this, the sin, it, it, the light of God's word, and it, and it grieved him so desperately inside. And it shined a light in the rest of the people. They saw, wow, this is not good. They begin to realize and so you see this response happening amongst the people that they came as well. And notice here that they also wept bitterly. As he himself began to pray and, and confess and seek the Lord, it impacted the, those around him. And without him really, he doesn't address it. He wouldn't start preaching to them so much, as much you know, but it was just the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit began to work amongst those people and begin to convict them, and they brought them to this place we'll find of repentance. But notice again, it started with confession. He, he was confessing their sin. And I think it's important, it's very important to understand that there's two steps to be taken in relation with the Lord when we find that we're going the wrong way. First of all, it's confession. It's to confess what I'm doing wrong. Secondly, is to repent. Now, because confessing precedes the, the repentance, it's important, I believe, for us to confess concisely, accurately, and not be gen- general in our confession. You know, Lord, I realize I haven't been a good person today kind of general. It doesn't really address anything. Or, Lord, I wasn't very nice to people. Yeah, I, I, I can see you're confessing, but let's be a little more specific. Lord, the way I treated that person was wrong. I was very rude. There's actually, the Bible doesn't address being nice. It says being kind, we're to be kind one to another. But, you know, saying, Lord, I was very rude to the way I treated that person. That's being direct, that's being concise, because then now I have a point to repent from. If I just say I wasn't very nice to them, well, okay, I'll try and be nicer next time. But I was rude, or the way I responded in the situation was wrong, you know, the way I treated that person and, and handling that situation. Then we have something to repent from. Being specific and concise is important. And so here we see that there's going to be a very specific thing they're turning from. This intermarrying with the pagans. They have a confession. They're confessing they had done wrong and compromised in this area. Now, of course, 
This in of itself is, is, a, is a symptom of a greater problem. Now, it will eventually, it, it, this symptom will create more symptoms, which is where Ezra is concerned about, but it's a symptom. A symptom of something else is going on down in the heart is that their heart was not sold out for the Lord. Because the Lord made very clear they were not to do this. And if their heart was sold out to the Lord, they wouldn't have made that compromise to begin with. And so we see this revival as a return to this place of following the Lord, turning back to, to recommitting to the Lord. And we'll find that that is one of the key parts of their repentance. Again, it's so important when we is an understanding where our failure is at. So again, Ezra is praying, weeping, and so now this large assembly of men, notice men, women, and children, not just certain people, large spectrum people gather to him in a large company. And they also went bitterly. Notice here, now verse 2, it says, And Shechaniah, the son of Jael, he was one of the sons of Elam. He spoke up and said to Ezra, now this guy, uh, he is he is a son of a priest, one of the priests, and we'll notice that Elam is mentioned later on as one of the men who had was guilty of the sin, as well as um, uncles and, uh, and others, uh, relatives. But this man, Shechaniah, isn't mentioned amongst them. But we notice here, as he talks, though he wasn't named amongst those who had done this wrong, we well, notice how he addresses it, that it's a we and not they. He doesn't point the finger. He, he includes himself in the company of what's going on. But he takes leadership, takes the leadership role in this. So Shechaniah, the son of Jael, one of the sons of Elam, spoke up and said to Ezra, we have trespassed against our God. So notice here where the trespass is. It wasn't against the law. It wasn't against the governor. It wasn't against the king. It wasn't against Ezra. It was against our God. And it's important again to see, because if we don't address who, who we trespassed in, who we've offended, we're not going to know who to go back and reconcile with. And so here they point out, we have trespassed against our God and have taken pagan wives from the peoples of the land. Again, I point out, he himself hadn't done this, but notice the we. He didn't say, these people, they've done this wrong and I told them they shouldn't do it and they're doing it. I've been warning them. No, it's, we have done this. And I love that about this. It's the, the grace and mercy in the way this is approached. And that's why we should approach one another. You know, it really impacted me years ago. I had gone to Chuck Smith, my pastor. Actually, I was, I was going to the Bible college at the time. He probably knew who I was, just one of the students there. But, and, and I knew the Lord was calling me into ministry. And I just sensed that I needed prayer because I knew the enemy would want to derail me, to get me sidetracked, and, you know, with just temptations and stuff. And I knew that the enemy was strong and decisive, and I needed prayer. I remember one night, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking, I'm like, communing with the Lord about this. Lord, I, I, need, I need someone to pray over me. And the Lord put my heart, go have Chuck Smith pray for you. So he, he lives in Costa Mesa, which is an hour and a half away from here. I'm at the Bible College in Marietta, you know, Riverside, California. And, and, says, and he doesn't even know who I am. He says, well, isn't he coming to teach tomorrow? This is, you know, this is Thursday. He come, he, we come out every Friday to teach the chapel class. I'm like, right, he is. Why don't you ask for prayer afterwards? Okay, well, Lord, if that's the case, if that's what you're leading me to do, provide an opportunity to do that. You know, and, uh, and so, of course, that chapel service, you know, chapel got out at noonish, a little after noon, and we'd go, usually go to lunch. I had to go to work almost right away, so I had just enough time to go over to the cafeteria, grab some food. They'd usually give me some food to take with me to go to work. It was nice. I got to have, you know, you know, I got to bring nice food to, to work with me. I, I worked at a grocery store off campus. But they let me grab my, a meal and take it with me. So I go into the, actually to the, the staff dining hall to get the food instead of going to the student dining hall. So I walk in there to go get my food. And lo and behold, there's Chuck Smith sitting there talking to the staff. And I'm thinking, you know, I walk right by and got my food and begin to walk out. And the Lord says, aren't you going to ask him to pray for you? I'm like, 
I don't want to disrupt him. You asked for opportunity to have him pray for you. There I provided. What are you waiting for? <laughs> this is the turn. So, okay. so I walk over and says, Chuck, can you pray for me? You know, I just, I really sense I need prayer for, you know, just being protected, you know, just not to be derailed and just the Lord guard my heart. And, and he looks at me and he goes, sure. Said, Great. You know, and so I, I got down and next to him was he sitting in his chair and, and he just, and he laid his hand on me and started praying, Lord, help us to stay on the course you've called us to. Lord, help us to follow you. And it just really impacted me in that he included himself in this prayer, that it wasn't just, here's this poor Bible college student who needs prayer, but he was, in, he was entered into that prayer with me. And that really spoke to me in a very real way. How I just Here's this man God's using worldwide. And here's this young kid, you know, Going to Bible college, hardly knew who I was, and he just, Lord, help us to follow you, keep our eyes on you, protect us, you know, just, and it was just so, it just ministered to me, but it was, but really, like, with also the grace in that. It's not about, you know, me trying to be there, but it's, we're in this together as a family. And, uh, and that's what I see here, is it's not about him and they, but it's about we. And that's the way we need to approach one another. We're on the same family. We're on the same side. And, and may we not give opportunity for the enemy to divide us. we got to be working together, standing together, encouraging one another, building each other up in our faith in Jesus Christ. And not give place to the enemy to divide us. And so we see that here as this man Shechaniah takes the leadership role, but he, again, he's, he says, we, we have done this, this trespass against our God, and we have taken pagan wives from the peoples of the land. Yet now, look at this, yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. I love that. He says, this is definitely a dark time. We, we've failed, we've sinned, we've done wrong. But there's hope. Why? Because he saw the repentance. There's a change of attitude. There's there's an understanding that what they were doing was wrong and they need to turn from it. And there's hope now because we're turning back to our God to follow him the way we should be. He saw there's hope to go forward because of the attitude of repentance. You see, there's no hope until we repent because our hope is in Christ. And until we turn to him, we can't find the hope. We can't find the strength. We can't find the power to overcome. So he sees there's hope. He's able to look beyond the sin, the failure, and where this is going because he sees where there's revival happening. There's hope because revival is happening. There's a change of direction occurring. Yet now there's hope in Israel in spite of this. Going on, verse 3 says, Now, look, he goes on to say, Now, therefore, this is second eye speaking, continue. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and those who have been born to them. He says, let's make a covenant to repent from this. So we confession, we confess what we did wrong, we trespassed against our God, we've taken pagan wives, but let's make a covenant to repent. Let's change direction. And because, again, they addressed the sin correctly, now they have a point to do, turn from and know where to turn to. And going on, it says, according to the advice, according to the advice of my master and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God. So he's referring to your Ezra because Ezra's been instructing them that this is wrong, and let it be done according to the law. So now he says, notice now he addresses Ezra, who's on the ground, bowing down, praying, confessing, weeping, overwhelmed over this. He says, arise, for this matter is your responsibility, and we also are with you. So Ezra, this is your responsibility to lead us into this. (laughs) Boy, oh boy. But, you know, that's what they're, he's acknowledging. You came here to lead us in the right way. And so we're here to follow. But notice we are here with you to do this. 
So he says, be, good, be, be of good courage. Be of good courage and do it. Hey, we're going to help. We're going to walk with you through this. We want to follow you in this leadership role. We are here to stand beside you because we want to repent. We've confessed. We've acknowledged a sin. And we want to turn back to our God. We want to make a covenant. So you lead us in the right direction. And so notice then Ezra rose. And he made the leaders of the priests, the Levites, and all Israel swear an oath that they would do according to this word. And so they swore an oath. So he made them make a commitment that they're going to do what's right. Then Ezra, he rose up from before the house of God and went into the chamber of Jehonahim, the son of Eliashib. And when he came there, he ate no bread and drank no water, for he mourned because of the guilt of those from the captivity. So his heart was still so heavy, he could not eat at this point. He was just so grieved. And, but he got up and he went in, into the chamber and moved on from there. So going on verse 7, they issued a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the descendants of the captivity. Notice everybody this is going to, not just those who were guilty. They sent out a proclamation to everybody that they must gather at Jerusalem and that whoever would not come within three days, according to the instructions of the leaders and elders, all his property would be confiscated and he himself would be separated from the assembly of those from the captivity. So pretty strong. So you see here Ezra using, because he was given authority from the king to, to act on behalf of the king. He was given governing authority. And we see him utilizing that here. He says, okay, you know, everyone is required to come to Jerusalem because we're going to have a meeting over this situation, and if anyone doesn't come, your, your property is going to be confiscated, and you will be basically you know, separated from amongst the people. Now, again, notice, I mean, pretty strong, drastic measures, very severe, but it gets even more. Going on, it says, Verse 9, so all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered at Jerusalem within three days. So notice here the response. All the men gathered there in Jerusalem within three days. And it was the ninth month on the 20th, uh, in the, on the 20th of the month, in the 20th day of the ninth month, and all the people sat in the open square of the house of God so there's that big square there, a big courtyard out in front of the, the, the temple. They were seated there to hear the instructions, and they're trembling because of this matter. They knew that there was going to be some consequences coming, and because of the heavy rain. So the rain wasn't helping either. You can imagine a little cold, a little wet, and start shivering. So, but you got to get this picture of this very dark, gloomy situation. I think that's what's being painted here as well. I mean, this is what was happening. It was, it was raining, but it was, it was a severe situation. But notice people were there. Again, you see that people were persevering in the midst of this because the Spirit of God was working. There was a revival going on amongst the people, a heart to repent, a heart to turn, understanding that there needed to be severe measures taken. And so people came. They were willing to come from wherever they were at, and respond to come to Jerusalem and even be there in the rain and sit through this because they understood this was important. And I think that's important for us to gather because sometimes I think we, we approach our relationship with God at a very convenient-based relationship. We're willing to follow the Lord as long as it's convenient for us, as long as it doesn't Put us out too much, you know. We got certain parameters and boundaries as to how far we're going to go, and the Lord's willing to work with us. He's going to work with us where, however much we're going to allow Him to work in our lives. But as we're going to find out, the greatest fulfillment comes from yielding our lives to the Lord to the greatest capacity. The more we are willing to let God have authority in our lives, the more we're willing to give our lives over to Him, the better opportunity we're going to have to experience Him in our lives. 
And as we're going to find that the sin that was going on was, would eventually lead to destruction, lead to death, lead to separation from their God, which would have led them to emptiness. But the true fulfillment can come by returning to the Lord and experiencing his life. So here they are sitting in the courtyard in the rain to hear the instructions. And it says here, as verse 10, Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have transgressed and taken pagan wives, adding to the guilt of Israel. So this is not the first time it's happened. Now it happened again. Now we're adding to it. Now therefore make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the pagan wives. And so then all the assembly answered and said with a loud voice, Yes, as you have said, we must do. Notice they didn't say we will do it. We'll try to do it. We want to do it. They didn't say that. They said we must do this. They understood this was a must do and not maybe I'll try to or maybe want to, but it's a must do this. We must do it. We must turn from this situation that we're in. But there are many people, they say, and it's a season for heavy rain, and we are not able to stand outside. Of course, you know, they have all come, many of them come from outside the city, so they don't have houses there. And so typically when they travel from out far, they stay in courtyards or um, rooms that don't have a roof on them, and so they would be exposed to adverse weather. So they says, hey, we don't have a safe place to abide. And so they says, hey, since there's a lot of us that have done this transgression and it's raining, it's cold. And he says, please, verse 14, please let the leaders of the entire assembly stand, you know, put, appoint them, and let all those in our cities who have taken pagan wives come at appointed times. So in other words, let's make an appointment and have people come regular, you know, at appointed times together with the elders and judges of their cities until the fierce wrath of our God has turned away from us in this matter. And so, hey, we want to do what's right. But, we, you know, can you give us some time to do this? And so we find here this guy, John, Jonathan, the son of Asiel and, Jehaz, and Jehaziah, the son of Tikva, they oppose this. So there's these two guys that stood up against it. We're not, I'm not sure who these guys exactly are. It doesn't, doesn't mention that they had a particular position of authority. Um, these t- Tikva and uh, J- um, Asiel, these were priests and Levites named at different times in history. So they may be that the sons of these priests and Levites, which would mean they're in leadership. Um, and we also notice here, um, the latter part of the verse, uh, Meshulam, and Shabbatai, the Levite, gave them support. So these, guys, these two guys supported them. We'll find that in verse 29, Meshulam was actually guilty of this, and he repented. He was named amongst those priests. He was named as a priest who repented from this. So he apparently was supporting Jonathan and the other guy, um, Jehaziah. Jehaziah um, he was supportive of them and their decision, but he himself did repent. But it, these are the only two people that we noticed that did not res, you know, respond to this covenant. So then the, then the descendants of the captivity did so. And Ezra the priest with certain heads of the fathers and their households were set apart by the fathers' households, each of them by name. And they sat down the first day of the tenth month to examine the matter. And by the first day of the first month of the year, they finished questioning all the men who had taken pagan wives. So it took three months to work through it, but they completed getting this resolved. But you're thinking, wow, drastic measures in divorce. Again, as they point out, God hates divorce. You know, is he not? Is he contradicting himself by you know, by them divorcing these wives? Did they? Get too extreme? You know, some have said, well, you know, they just went too far. You know, this was too extreme. Uh, 
and, and as I read on this here, I found that one thing that we must keep in mind is considering the consequences of where this is leading, considering the outcome. As I pointed out, this was part of the problem of them going into captivity in the first place. Having them intermarried with pagan wives, the pagan wives in turn their hearts from the Lord, and they started following the pagan deities, which then would have eventually led to their captivity. So the outcome was far severe. So you can look at way in, okay, you got this extreme severe outcome on here if they don't repent over here. And yes, it meant taking some drastic measures. And as I pointed out also, that some of these here, they, were take, they had left their first wife and taken younger wives was part of the problem as well. But again, like the main thing was, again, was the repentance back to the Lord. Getting, it, getting it back on track, and that's the key. And I believe the proper application for you and for me, the proper application here is we see the severe measures taken, taking drastic steps to deal with sin. That's what I believe the Lord wants us to take home here, is the drastic steps, taking assertive, decisive steps to deal with sin. They had married into it in a sense. That's the picture here. They had married into sin, taking pagan wives. They had associate they had now become one with the sinful practices and now it was infiltrating their lives and i believe in many regards that we have done much the same way in many other areas Maybe there's areas where we have made compromises in our lives we've married into simple practices and i believe the lord would want you and me to take decisive decisions in dealing with sin we're told in ephesians 4 422, the importance of putting off, putting away that former conduct, the, the conduct of the old man or that corrupt man, the man after the flesh, the man after sinful practices. He says, to put off concerning your former conduct, your way you live before Christ, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. If you let that old man, in a sense, that, that corrupt nature continue to live in you, it's going to corrupt. It's going to deteriorate your soul. It's going to ruin you. So you need to put it off. You need to divorce it. Put it away from you, not hang on to it. But on the other hand, we're told in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, what we're supposed to do in the repentance. Repent from the corrupt man, turn from the corrupt man, and put on, we're told, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. But we can't put on Christ until we put off the flesh. We can't live for both. Jesus says you can't have two masters. You're going to love one and hate the other. You're going to be divided. So you got to choose who you're going to serve. And so putting off that flesh, the corruption, divorcing yourself from that, and putting on Jesus Christ, embracing him with more, more and more of him. Moreover, we're told that as we understand the grace of God, but we can't understand the grace of God until we come to Him and look to Him, understand our sins are forgiven. And it's the grace of God that teaches us to turn from carnality. Because when we understand the grace of God, we under, you know, when we realize how much God loves us and cares for us and His plans for us are so good, hopefully it'll open our eyes to see that the world we're living for, which is corrupt, perverse, and destroying us, oppressive and dark. Why would we want to serve it anymore? It should lead us to repentance. It should lead us back to Christ. We're told in Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God's grace that saves us has appeared. God has made available to all the salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. And it teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts 
that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Why would he want to live that which we're delivered from? You know, when, when we realize we're sinners separated from God, and that we, ne- we needed to be delivered from sin, and so we cry out to God, say, deliver me, set me free. Why would he want to go back now what we were set free from? And that was the same case here. They were just delivered from the pagan culture, the pagan nation of of Babylon. They were just delivered and brought here to the the promised land, back, brought back. Why would they want to now return back and live under the same bondage that they were living in in under captivity? That's the case. That was the picture that's being painted here. They were delivered from that, brought to the promised land, brought back, and the Lord's restoring them, rebuilding a relationship with him. But now they were going back. And they're saying, no, we need to divorce ourselves from that life. Come back to the Lord. Fill our life with him. Put it on Jesus Christ. Put it on, back on a full relationship with God. And again, as it says in Romans 8.13, see, under, when we understand, as Ezra understood, how severe the byproduct of living after the flesh has severe consequences, when we understand how desperate the situation is, will come to place broken to the Lord. As it says in Romans 8.13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. It leads to death. When we live according to the flesh, it leads to death. Now, you may not physically die, you may not, but it's going to bring death. Maybe death in relationship with loved ones. How many times I've heard of broken marriages because of drugs and alcohol and, and promiscuity and other choices that have happened. It's brought death to the marriage relationship, death to the children in a sense. It's brought death to the home or maybe compromise at work. It brings death to that relationship, the, the fidelity within the workplace. Maybe, you know, again, compromise in our own relationship with the Lord where we've sinned. It brings death in relationship with the Lord. We, we become severed in our relationship with him when we allow sin to reign in our lives. It will bring death. But we're told if we live by the Spirit, we'll put to death the deeds of the body and you'll live. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the grace of God. God's Spirit, God's, His Spirit in you, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, lives in you and lives in me if you're giving your life to Jesus. And it's His Spirit that gives us the grace, the ability to overcome the struggles and lead us into life. So the more we embrace the Lord in our lives, the more strength we'll have of the Lord to overcome. And the more we overcome, the more we'll give place to the Lord in our lives, the more we'll go, we can go forward in, in victory. And it's just, you see how it just, it goes and it, it builds upon itself. The more we yield, the more we'll overcome. The more we overcome, the more we'll yield. The more we yield, we overcome. The more we, and it's just going and the grace of God just continues to lead us closer and closer until we're just enjoying Him, fulfilling. And we're no longer captive to the sins of this world and beat down and discouraged. Ezra knew that, understood that, and he was grieved over that. That's why he was so broken over it. So he interceded and wept, and, and now the people responding, and they say, yes, we must do this. We must repent. We must get right on track with the Lord. And as Paul would say in Galatians 5.24, those who are Christ, those who have given life to Jesus Christ, they have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. And family, this is what we must be doing. We must do that. Because we are followers of Jesus Christ. Bring our life to Jesus, the cross of Jesus Christ. Say, Lord, we want to die there with you. Die to ourselves. Die to that corrupt nature of the flesh and put you on. It says, embrace you in our lives. They understood their need to do that. And I believe we also need to do that. Divorce ourselves from the sinful nature and put on Jesus Christ. Embrace him with all of our heart, mind, and soul. And so we're going to skip the list of names there because... It's just a whole lot of names. I, I mentioned there's a couple of names that kind of stand out. Like I said, Meshulam, who was a, one of the guys that was a priest, and he supported Jonathan and his other guy. Um, but he did mention, he, he was listed there. And also I pointed out that uh, um, Shechaniah, he wasn't in that list, but his fam- some of his family were, and they 
but they're, they're repenting. I would not recommend this is one way to get in the Bible. I mean, here it is. Their name is in the Bible for taking the sin for all for the history of this world. Here they ought to be written. But also looking at these were men who chose to do what's right, to repent. And in that sense, there was hope. Hope he made. These guys saying, okay, we're going to do what's right. We're going to repent. We're going to be leaders to set the, the path straight. And so picking up verse 44, and all these had taken pagan wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children as well. So notice it wasn't a whole lot of children, but there were some children impacted by this. And, you know, it doesn't talk about, you know, I'm sure there was some procedures put in place to help provide for these people. But again, also, it just shows how grievous sin is. It has its consequences. But you've got to consider the greater consequence, how it leads to destruction. And as we look at our lives, and maybe there are things, well, you know, we don't want to inconvenience this situation or that situation because, you know, so I'm not going to get rid of this sin. And so we go on in the compromise. we got to weigh it out. What's this going to lead to? What, where is this leading us? And weigh out the greater, more important getting our life back on track with the Lord. And the Lord loves you. He has great plans for all of us. He loves us all so very much. And so to be crucified with Christ, you know, it, 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 it's, it is drastic. I mean, you know, think about the cross. The cross wasn't a very pleasant thing. Suffering, dying. But it was dying to self. Some people say, well, I'm just taking my cross and dealing with the situation of taking care of my loved ones. Well, that may be it, but that's not really exactly what the Lord's getting at. You see, taking up the cross means that you are choosing to obey God's word. When you think about Jesus when he went to the cross, he was following the will of his father. He was denying his flesh. His flesh would say, no, I want to preserve myself, lift myself. But he chose, not my will, but thy will be done. He chose to put the will of the Father above his own will. And he went to the cross and died. And that's what the cross is to you and to me, is choosing to put the will of God the Father above our own will. Saying, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen? Let's pray. So, Lord, we come to you tonight, to the cross. And you know where we're at today, each and every one of us. You know where we're struggling where we're all at in our relationship with you. And Lord, we desire, we desire more of you and less of ourselves. And so Lord, I pray as we're here and maybe sing this last song, Lord, that you be speaking to us if you haven't already, Lord, that you would reveal to us those areas where we have embraced compromise where we have given our lives over to this world in some way, where we have married into this culture, this pagan world, and putting it before you. Lord, that we put off that old man and put you on. Put off the flesh and put on you, Jesus Christ, that we can be set free to live after your spirit, which is life, fulfillment. So Lord, minister to us tonight in this closing song. We worship you. We thank you. We thank you that you love us. That you've forgiven us. You don't condemn us. And you're there waiting for us to come to you and surrender to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.